ENT Emergencies by Dr. Hazem Muhammad Abdel Tawab, consultant of ENT Head and Neck Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University. In this group of lectures, I'm going to present some ENT emergencies that are very common and come usually to our A&E rooms. This group of lectures is going to fit the general practitioners, the ENT beginners, and the family medicine doctors. So today I'm going to start with one of the most common emergencies that come to our room, which is epistaxis, causes and management, and this is part one. In order to manage epistaxis, we, know, we need to know from where that bleeding comes from. So classification is so much important. So anterior epistaxis and posterior epistaxis. What is the difference between anterior and posterior and to which thing we are correlating. Usually we are correlating the anterior or posterior in relation to the periform aperture. So anterior epistaxis is anterior to that and posterior epistaxis is posterior to that. So usually the 90% cases of epistaxis are anterior epistaxis which is usually mild. Usually the source is the Kesselbach's plexus the Kesselbach's plexus, while the posterior epistaxis, which is 10% of cases, but usually severe, usually needs intervention, the source will be the internal maxillary artery and the sphenopalatine branch. So in this uh, illustration or diagram, we can see the Kesselbach's plexus. The Kesselbach's plexus is formed by the superior labial artery from the facial artery, which is a branch of the external carotid, the greater palatine artery, also this, is, this belongs to the external carotid artery. The anterior ethmoidal artery here, which is a branch from the ophthalmic, which is a branch from the internal carotid artery. Also, there are some, uh, some blood supply in the nose, like posterior ethmoidal artery and the sphenopalatine artery. The sphenopalatine artery is a branch from the external carotid, while the posterior ethmoidal artery is a branch from the ophthalmic of the internal carotid artery. So the Kesselbach's plexus, as we see here, is formed from the superior labial artery, the greater palatine artery, the anterior ethmoidal artery, as well as the sphenopalatine. While there is another plexus here, this plexus is the most difficult to treat. It usually needs intervention and usually it is severe, which is the Woodruff's plexus. The Woodruff's plexus is formed mainly from the sphenopalatine artery. It is lying in the posterior part of the nose. So in order to manage epistaxis, we need to know the causes of epistaxis. So the causes can be local causes and can be systemic or general causes. So going with the local causes, the most important and common cause is the trauma, as in nose picking. For example, in a children, usually the child is standing to do some nose picking. So this is one of the most uncommon types and causes of trauma. There is also the nasal surgery. Nasal surgery also can cause trauma to the nose, which can cause epistaxis, as well as fracture. Fracture is a sort of accidental trauma or an assault, for example, that can cause bleeding. Dry atmosphere. Usually the dry atmosphere causes nasal crusts. This nas these nasal crusts usually will lead the patient or the person to just do some itching and some manipulations in the nose. So this will also cause some bleeding. Irritants, as smoking, can cause epistaxis, as well as addiction, especially cocaine addiction, which usually affects the little area of the nasal septum where the Kesselbach's plexus lies. Nasal steroids, which are commonly used in allergic rhinitis, can be affecting or can affect the epistaxis, can cause epistaxis with the long use. Tumors as well. We need not to forget about tumors, especially if that patient is an old age patient having unilateral epistaxis or a young boy having unilateral epistaxis, which might reflect, uh, in the first case, carcinoma or or other some sort of malignant tumors, while in the boy, in the young boy, it can reflect the nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. 
general causes the most common cause is the hypertension usually hypertension when when it happens usually that uh, old it affects old uh, or adults uh, and it can lead to bilateral mostly epistaxis as well as bleeding disorders which can be discovered dating since birth okay in order to manage the case we need to think think first before you manage do i need to do some laboratory tests for this patient if so when okay the first thing if this epistaxis is recurrent yes i need to do some tests because it's not a single episode if the bleeding source is multiple in the nose which means that you cannot identify the source and this is usually happening from more than one site it means that you need to do that some labs to exclude the blood coagulopathies as well as if you are suspecting coagulopathy like for example if the patient is having bleeding from any other orifice so if the bleeding is recurrent if the bleeding source is multiple and if coagulopathy is suspected you need to do some labs so what are they usually you are going to screen for cbc so that you can know the platelet count you can know also if there is infection by the wpcs uh, you can know if there is anemia the hemoglobin content you need to do some prothrombin time and partial thromboplastin time which gives you an idea about the extrinsic and the intrinsic but uh, intrinsic pathways and the blood group as well the blood group is so important because it will give you a way if it's needed some time to do blood transfusion for that patient if it is severe uh, epistaxis so you need to do it with every case of recurrent or multiple or coagulopathy suspicion History is always important, so you need to take some time with the history. Like, for example, was there a trauma causing a fracture? Was there that child usually doing some nose picking? You need to know. Idiopathic, if it usually comes without a definite cause, but it can be correlated with the dry atmosphere around. Operation, for example, if this is a naturogenic bleeding, usually after surgery. Or a drug which can affect the bleeding coagulation, the bleed, the coagulation of the blood. So, general, you need also to just know if there is bleeding from any other site, like a GIT bleeding or gingival bleeding, because this will give you an idea if this is a bleeding coagulopathy. As well as you need to know about if there is an uncontrolled hypertension, especially if this bleeding is bilateral. You need also to have what's called site-wise thinking. What is the site-wise thinking? It means that you're going to correlate your management with the site of epistaxis. For example, if the bleeding is only anterior, this will give you some sort of relief. Why is that? Because it's usually less severe and it's usually easy to be controlled because you can see the source, but if the bleeding, and here you can know that, that the source of bleeding will be the castle back plexus, which is in the lateral area of the nasal septum, as we have just demonstrated in the first diagram, or can be in the anterior end of the inferior turbinate, which is also accessible. But if this bleeding is posterior, it means what? It means that you cannot see the source with your simple speculum examination, or you can see that the patient is. Uh, just having some post nasal bleeding and you can see it while examining the oropharynx that blood is coming through the nasopharynx to the oropharynx this will give you some worries because usually because usually it will need major intervention usually it is more severe usually it is difficult to control because it's difficult to see the source the bleeding here will come from the woodruffs Plexus, as we have mentioned in the first diagram, or comes from the nasopharynx. For example, if this patient is having a nasopharyngeal angiofibroma or a carcinoma, or for example, after adenoidectomy, that's what we have said before, that the cause might be a surgical as well. 
general assessments. When you see your patient, you need to do some management, some investigations, some examination tools, which are going to help you. For example, if I'm going to have a blood pressure assessment, especially if that patient is an adult, male or female, this will give you about the current situation of his blood pressure, if it is high or low. And this will also give you an, uh, an early tool of assessment with the vitals, for example, the respiratory rate or the pulse, so that you can exclude the shock signs, because this is so important for you. If this patient is having severe epistaxis, it means that he is in bending shock, and then the management would be completely different. Okay, you need to prepare your instruments. Good light you need, of course, by the headlight using nasal speculum. This is the nasal speculum. You need a good suction. Why is that? Because you need to remove the blood clots. Removing the blood clots will help you to know the source and will help you to stop it. Definitely, you will need your eye protection management. Definitely, you will need your mask because sometimes the patients are spitting or sniffing or doing some uh, uh, unintentionally spitting of blood or coughing of blood, which might just lead you to get affected by that bleeding. So you need to give yourself the eye protection, give yourself the mask protection for the nose as well as the mouth. First aid management. You need first to know what is the position I'm going to put my patient in. If your patient is not in the shock stage, and this is so easy as we have said, we are going to mention the shock stage, symptoms and manifestations later on in the part two lecture. You need first to position your patient. So the best position is sitting and leaning forwards. You need also to pinch the nostrils. We are coming to these two points, one then the other. Sitting and leaning forwards, or what we are calling the trotter's method. The trotter's method, you are going to just lean the head forward, sitting, lean the head forward, and pinch, squeeze the nostrils. So you need to squeeze the nostrils. Why is that? And you need to wait for some time. Leaning forwards will help you to avoid that the patient will not have any swallowing and spitting because if you if the patient is putting his head backwards it means that he's going to have some bleeding behind and he's going to have swallowing some swallowing and then spitting of the blood it will help another thing because if this blood usually comes to the stomach it will lead to nausea and vomiting and this will cause you also troubles will increase the agony of the patients and his stress and then it means that the bleeding will continue also, it will avoid the airway inhalation because if blood is coming posterior, it means that the source of aspiration or inhalation is there. And this will also make your management so difficult and will make his trouble so difficult. So leaning forward is a must. Then you should squeeze, as we have said here in the trotter's method, that you are the patient is leaning forward and pinching of the nostrils. So you are going to pinch on his nostrils or the patient himself can uh, uh, push or make a squeeze of the nostrils against the septum bilateral I mean so he's going as in the picture he's going to press both nostrils on the nasal septum for continuous uh, uh, acts for about 15 minutes sometimes 20 minutes this will help help in two different ways the first one is that it will give, it will give a time for clots to form on the source of bleeding and to stop it and it will give you time to assess and prepare your uh, instruments for further management. Instruct the patient all the time to breathe, to breathe through the mouth. So it's so, so important to make the patient breathe through the mouth and not to open the nose at all. The second thing in the management is you need to apply decongestants. The most common decongestants used are the xylomethazoline or the oxymethazoline which are known as Afrin or Otrivine in the market. So you need to know that you are going to put some drops or some spray form, cotton tips, and you put it in the nose like in the picture. But there are many side effects of, the, uh, of that material or these materials. 
uh, one of them is the rebound because with the long use of them with the repeated use of them it can cause some rebound bleeding it will also cause some dependence with time because with the patient if that if the patient is going to use by himself without coming back to you it means that usually he will have dryness and this will cause more bleeding later so you need to instruct your patient that thylomethazoline or oxymethazoline needs only to be used uh, whenever there is epistaxis by you and it's only a first aid measure if it's going to be done by him at home it should not be repeated we should not also forget that if it is going to be absorbed by the blood it will affect the heart rate it can cause hypertension so it's not like it's not like to be used in a hypertensive patient so it will give you some time to see and control usually 65 percent of the anterior epistaxis will stop and then you can manage to see the source but you should take care as we have said from the rebound bleeding if that patient now after booting the decongestant becomes more or less the bleeding becomes less then you will have the time to relax and help your patient how you're going to help your patient I'm going to give him analgesia for the pain uh, i'm going to reassure him that this epistaxis is going to stop uh, I'm going to do my laboratory tests. Now this is the proper time to do the test. I'm going to reevaluate his general condition. Again, I'm going to measure the blood pressure. I'm going to just check the vital signs again because with all of these criteria, I need to go for the next step. If the bleeding stops, then I will not do anything. But if the bleeding continues, then I will go for the nasal mucosal inspection and the medication. What do I need that for? Usually my aim is to identify the source of bleeding that was not seen before because the bleeder was continuing to have that bleeding and you weren't able to see. That's why you have just applied the trotters method, the squeezing method. After that, you are going to just give some nasal decongestant. The bleeding becomes less. You will have the time to clearly identify any source that's not seen before and at that time also you are going to prepare for the next step which is either you are going to use your scope in order to identify the source if it is posterior for example or you are going to do cautery cauterization of that bleeding source if it is needed and if the bleeding is still going on in order to do nasal mucosal inspection you need to give some medicines you are going to insert for 20 minutes either oxymetazoline or lidocaine 2% with epinephrine 1 to 1000, lidocaine 2% with phenylephrine 4% 1 to 1, or hemostatic agents as tranexamic acid, and these are debatable and usually not used. So either of the three, the first three you can use, you can manage to put for 20 minutes in the nose, it will decongest the nose then it will help you to go for the next step as we have said if you are going to prepare for scopy or you are going to do some cauterization why i'm giving anesthetic agents to the patient i'm going to give him the anesthetic agents like lidocaine for example the aim my aim is to make less pain to make the patient feels less pain so that i'm going to do the endoscopy or I'm going to cauterize in the next step if it is needed. So usually going for that mix is going to make the patient benefit a lot from decreasing the score of pain that he's feeling. Uh, if the bleeding continues later on, we are going to just go for the scopy and to know the source of the bleeding, of course, and to do cauterization if it is needed. For the present time, thank you so much.